good. Alrighty, thank you, Jesus. What an atmosphere. Oh, I'm telling you. I want to say to you guys, great shall be your reward. That is excellent. Thank you for putting all your heart into that. That was excellent. Loved it, loved every moment of it. Well, we're talking about doing battles and um, I didn't even know that song was going to be sung tonight. But the word of the Lord that he put in my heart today is we need to take hold of the kingdom. I mean, there's a lot of what we have been talking about, especially here at Communion House, has been about knowing the times that we're in. One of the things that I know for sure is that the Lord's raised us up to prepare for his return. You know, I've shared with you multiple times that the deep conviction that I have is that the Lord has raised me to be the voice of him crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. I remember sometime when I was about the age of 15, I took some time away from craft making, from my engineering crafts and all what not that I used to do. I used to keep myself busy a lot with making crafts, trying to create the world that I want to see. And I thought physics was the way to do it. So I was very deep into electronics. I would make crafts. I, I made all kinds of things just to replace what I was seeing out there. And so a season came and I knew that the Lord was calling me to be more intimate with him. And so I shut everything down. I, I shut down my little lab that I had just be, beyond my father's garage was a storage area and I took it over. The neighbors would call me to come fix their TV. I wouldn't respond because I was everybody's technician. But that season of my life, I went seeking the Lord through complete isolation. I would only come out if my mom needed me to do anything and once in a while, I would come out just to eat something and get some air. And so my sister was, was back from school because she was in college at the time. And so she was on vacation, she came home and she wasn't seeing me at all. She wasn't seeing any of me. And that was very unlike me because my sister has always been like my second mom because she's much older than me. So whenever she came, came around, I wanted to be there, you know, just to celebrate her. And on one of those evenings, she was in the kitchen. They were there getting ready and I showed up and she looked at me and she said to me, who are you and what's been going on with you? Without batting an eye, without even mincing words, I heard a voice that spoke from within me. It was my mouth that was forming the sounds, but it wasn't, I didn't know what I was saying. I wasn't even thinking about it. I just looked at her with the fire of God in my eyes and I said, I am the voice of him crying in the wilderness. She went in the spirit that very moment. I had never seen her up until that time rejoice in the Lord as much as she did. The spirit of the Lord fell into that kitchen, particularly upon her. And that was when I knew that something about what I said had significance and even I needed to pay attention. I turned around and I went back into that room. Let me tell you something, it has been the journey of my life and the work of my existence to make the announcement of his return. I am not afraid to declare it, praise the Lord. You see, because one of the things that I knew for several years that I kept to myself is what, what I just shared with you, but I wouldn't share it because of the fact that I know that the moment you announce that you are the voice of him crying in the wilderness, then you should be ready for the opposition because they don't want him to show up. They do not want him to return. And so anything that looks like preparation for his coming goes under attack. But when the time came, the Lord Jesus appeared to me and he said to me, that no matter what happens, that I needed to keep going. And that was when I knew that it was time to make the announcement. And y'all were there. Many of you were there when I made the announcement and I said, look, this is what the Lord has called me to do. This is who I am. This is what he has prepared me for. I am no longer relenting. I am no longer afraid to announce that my sole mission is not to have beautiful children or to drive my wife around and do her chores. My sole business for existing, no, I'm, I, I mean, I, I said soul business. You see what I mean? Is to be that voice of him crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Everything centers around the moment that we have come to. One of the pastors in our local church when I was growing up, he used to say that the zero hour of power has come. We have come to zero hour. Now we're counting the minutes. 
And for this particular generation and the times that we're in, we are literally in the seconds before his second return. <laughs> Maybe that's why they call it seconds. And I tell you one thing for sure, I keep my ears open and my heart ready because at any point in time, he would say something that we need to know concerning his return. And for months and for years and months, we have been experiencing and receiving updates by the Holy Spirit concerning the return of the Lamb of God, of the Bridegroom. So, I say all of that to say that here at Communion House, we are not ignorant of the times that we're in. But there is more than just knowing the time. There is more than just knowing the season. We also have to be alert and to also know of our equipping. If I say this is the time that the kingdom will come, are you supposed to just wait for the kingdom to come? Oh, very good. Uh, this is communion house. Yeah. And so we've been saying, oh, the Lord is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. But we are not just announcing the timing of the arrival of the kingdom. We are also meant to describe and to describe in detail how men should prepare for the return. Because if all we have to do is wait for him to come, then knowing the time is all it takes. We just know the time and then we show up when he shows up. No, but there is more to it. And one of the things that is very critical concerning the second coming and what you and I must do and how we must prepare is that we need to recognize that the second coming is going to be announced by war. Warfare. The Lord Jesus said it. John the Beloved said it. That when the Lord Jesus returns, he is coming with tens of thousands of his saints and they are coming, they are riding into victory. But you do not just appear and arrive at victory without having gone through the battle. That final battle, the battle that we mostly call the battle of Armageddon, has already begun. The infantry has already been engaged. And I told you, I think it was around the month of September 2020, the Lord said to me that the infantry has already engaged in battle. And I started to observe from that moment onwards that the way prophecy was written, if we do not have insight by the Holy Spirit, we would miss it. How many people remembered when I taught around that time frame that the internet was Armageddon? You remember that I said the internet was Armageddon? You see, because Megiddo is a tell. A tell is, some people call it a mound, okay? A mound is not a natural mountain. A mound is a mountain that forms as a result of human activity. And the correct geological term for it is a tell, T-E-L, right? And so when the Bible says that that final battle is going to happen at Megiddo, several people were looking at the Megiddo that it was somewhere in the Middle East. But Megiddo means more than just one place. That is physical because it is not going to be fair of God if he comes to hand out crowns of victory when not everybody has been allowed to participate. If the battle was only going to happen in some, somewhere around the Middle East between um, Palestine and, and, and Tel Aviv, then why should we expect to get a crown? The Bible says Jesus is coming and he will reward with a crown those ones that have overcome. Now, how do you overcome when you haven't fought? So Megiddo has to be a place that is central to all of us. Now, I didn't understand this thing just geologically. Neither did I come to the comprehension of what I shared with you back then. Geographically, I came to the consciousness of it by revelation. So I cannot take credit for what I shared. The Holy Spirit revealed it to me for your sake. Because remember, the Bible says he has given gifts unto men. And those gifts are for the body of Christ. For edification, for rebuke, for reproof. For what? 
for the perfecting of the saints and for the edifying of the church. The edifying of the saints, the perfecting of the church. And so all of these things are there for our benefit so that we know exactly how to comport and compose ourselves. So I will just quickly touch on one more thing about Megiddo and the internet before I keep moving. And I said this before, so I'm only reminding you, if you haven't listened to that message, I encourage you to go and listen to it. Because one of the things that we were told is that when this battle of Armageddon begins, it will be the final battle between good and evil. However, as the battle begins, the enemy continues to recruit soldiers to replace the fallen ones. And a couple of months after I shared that the internet was Megiddo because Megiddo being a tale, a tale being a point that comes to be through the process of human activity is what the internet is. The internet is not just one thing. The internet is not the connection between my phone and your phone. The internet is the connection between all of the devices that we activate to speak to a public network. That's what an internet is. And so it is not just one place, but it is all places coming to terminate at one point. And that is the way you would describe Megiddo. Do you know the reason why several people were not able to find Megiddo who were theologians? Because they were looking for a mound that would be a naturally occurring mound. Whereas in reality, it's a tell. It forms. So let me give you an example. If we have a million people pass by this place repeatedly and continually doing business. The ground in this place will begin to rise and the path that leads to it will begin to wear. Do you know that that's what happens? When you look at ancient market squares, the paths that lead to the market, they wear out because as people walk, they're packing sand. But when they get to the marketplace, they deposit a lot of what they carry there. And over time, it begins to accumulate and it becomes a tail or popularly known as a mound. And that is exactly how the internet has grown to be what it is today. It is a product of several human activities through various transactions that we carry on, whether money, whether commercial transactions or things that we just do for entertainment, for education. But the more we get on that internet, the more the mound begins to grow. Even look at your own little Instagram. Every time you get on there, you feel the need to share your new trainers that you just bought or sneakers. Every time you get on there, that little shirt that you just bought, you want to take a selfie and let somebody know. Nobody deletes anything from the internet. If you think you're deleting it from your profile, congratulations to you. It is still sitting on the server somewhere. It never goes away. It is so almost an impossible for you to completely erase data that has been created from the internet because the internet is a self-replicating beast. It's almost like an animal. It keeps feeding on all of what you give to it and it keeps growing. And so that makes it fit perfectly the description of Megiddo. And what is going on in Megiddo? A battle between good and evil. What is going on on the internet? A battle for your soul, for your attention, for your loyalty. People are on the internet day to day selling you on one ideology or the other. And because in the world to come, there is no money, then that tells you that all of what's going on on the internet, even though money is involved, money is not the object of the battle. Money is not the object of this warfare because after this war is over, a new world begins and it's going to be a moneyless world. And so why should we be there thinking it's all about the money? Thinking, oh, they're collecting my information so they can sell me something new. They can sell me a trip to the Bahamas. No, they don't care whether you go to the Bahamas or go to Timbuktu. They just want to know why you're going. Are you going to glorify God or are you going to seek your own pleasure? Everything on the internet right now is all about the angels observing the loyalties of the hearts of men. Who is weed and who is a tear? Myself and brother Matthew can go on the same internet and buy the same exact same shirt whilst he is buying his so that he can put communion house logo on it and encourage people to come to the house of fellowship. I may be buying mine so that I can show somebody that I still got it. 
same shirt, same internet, but the angels have recorded two different transactions. Because like I told you on Saturday, Jesus said the work of separating the wheat from the tears is not the work of the church. It's not the work of the saints. It's not an assignment to the believer. It is the responsibility of the angels of my father who would come and gather the tears after having separated them from the wheat. And then they will gather them together, throw them in the fire, and then return to gather the wheat into the barn. And the separation is ongoing 247. So what are we doing about the knowledge that we have received? How are we preparing our hearts? Do we live with that consciousness that we are at war and as war as and as warring soldiers, we are supposed to concern ourselves primarily with victory as opposed to be filled with the desire for pleasure. The Bible says that no one that is at war engages himself in the affairs of this world. Do you know that if we're standing side by side with guns and bayonets and we have the enemy on the other side of the line, that is not the time for you to be telling me, oh, I heard what you said about me last night and I'm grossly disappointed. Nobody says that when they are on the battlefield. On the battlefield, it doesn't matter what you say about me last night. I don't want you killed because you are my covering. And I want to live so that you are not exposed. Because I am your covering. At that particular point in time, it's all about advancing the flag of our kingdom beyond that battle line so that we can possess the gates of our enemies. So when you find people that are tail-bearing and backbiting and frivolously following the affairs of this world, they don't know that they are on the battlefield. They are there as body armor for the enemy. The enemy is lining up lots and lots of believers and using them to take the hit because they are ignorant. So that was what I was going to tell you about Megiddo. But after I taught about Megiddo, what were the series of things that I started to say after that? I started to talk about the strategy of the enemy. The Lord revealed to me Satan's strategy for execution in these last days. And one of the things that the Lord revealed to me is Satan's recruiting, recruiting or recruitment strategy. Because if you don't know how Satan is recruiting, you will line up getting ready to vote for Satan and not even know it. Because Jesus said it. The Bible says that power was given to the dragon, that serpent of old, with which to deceive the nations, that if care is not taken, even the elect shall be deceived. And that is the reason why we cannot afford to be ignorant of the devices of the crafty. Someone says, Brother Moses, you're always talking about warfare. You're always talking about the enemy. You're always talking about opposition. Well, yeah, because we're at war. And then there's no break until we receive the crown. There is no ceasefire until we receive the crown. And this is what I'm going to talk about until the day the Lord Jesus calls me forward and says, you faithful servant, come into the rest of your Lord. And I receive that crown of glory. I guarantee you with every breath that I have, while I am still in this corruptible flesh, I will teach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let the soldiers line up. It is time for war. And I don't even know why people complain. We have had decades and decades of pleasure messages sermons that just please the man things that just make you feel good after service you're like I'm making this my church the pastor, the pastor teaches so good and then if they ask you what did he teach he'd be like um, he just feels good it's so good yeah my wife and I we've been in some places where in every message it's so good even if it was downloaded from the internet so good Oh yeah, and that is because people are so desperate for pleasure that they will masquerade or disguise or manipulate whatever is in front of them to please them. But I tell you one thing, we cannot complain because we have had our fill of pleasure. The Bible says there is a time for everything under the heavens. But also that same Bible says if you know that you are giving to too much pleasure, when you are called to sit at the table of royalty, put a knife to your throat so that your gluttony does not expose your shame. 
That's what the Bible says. Put a knife to your throat. But many people don't want a knife to their throat because it looks like a dangerous thing to do. But Jesus said that if your eye will cause you to go to hell, you might as well just block it out. So we need to know how to limit pleasure seeking, possibly eliminate pleasure seeking so that we can stand lean enough to run the race. Many of us in the realm of the spirit, we are completely overweight with all the goodness that God has made available to us because it's all about what I can get. Oh, there's a conference in the, in, in, in making, is it baking or making? Oh, there's a conference in making and I'm going there to have some bacon. Oh, there's a, com yeah, that one was given to me. What can I do? People are running around everywhere, one conference to the other. And what are they looking for? The things that they can get and people have become spiritually overweight because they cannot discern between what is needed for war and what is not. All of that is still a preamble. There's somewhere this thing is going. But I'm gonna say one more thing before we read from the book of Genesis. You see, Jesus said one thing to his disciples. We talked about it on Saturday. He called, in fact, I've been talking about it almost every time now, four messages ago. I've been talking about the fact that who do people say that I am? And when Peter spoke by the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, Jesus did not say that I will build my church and it's gonna be so good looking. He wasn't concerned about the beauty because he knows whatever he makes is beautiful. The Bible says that whatever it is, that the Bible says that after God was done, he looked at all of his work and behold, it was all good. So God is not concerned about the beauty of it. He's not concerned about the effectiveness of it. He's not, I mean, about the, um, what you might call it, about the structure and the nature of its appearance. No, he was more concerned about the effectiveness of what he's building in being able to overpower the enemy. That's why he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What was he telling us invariably? He was telling us that he's building his church for battle so that that church can advance the kingdom of God beyond the gates of hell and spoil the enemy. You know, I tell you that God expects us to do things, but he will not ask us to do things that himself hasn't first done. That was why Jesus, first of all, went deep down into hell to spoil principalities and powers. And when he came out, he gave us the power to go do the same. And he says, over to you. Now you also go and possess the gates of your enemies. So as much as we are excited that Jesus is coming, as much as we're excited that his reward is with him, as much as we're excited about incorrupt. The, the incorruptible body that we will put on, how we will receive immortality when the time is come, we need to also note that immortality is not just attained by smiling your way to hell. No. Even the Lord Jesus, he had to fight. Look at the battle in the Garden of Gethsemane. And do you think when he got to hell and they just showed up, they're like, okay, well, since you made it to the party, you can just have the power. No, Jesus told us what was going to happen in hell before he went to hell. He said, no man goes into the house of a strong man and recovers what he has previously taken without, first of all, binding the strong man. And this particular strong man is a fiery dragon. Do you think you're just going to bind the dragon the way you do to your little chihuahua? No. Dragons don't go down easy. I don't know if you know. Maybe you should go and watch Jurassic Park again and see how those dinosaurs are. That gives you an idea. Let me tell you something, folks. When Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, it was his every expectation and very expectation that we would at least attempt to go to battle. So let's look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 11. Genesis 12, 11. We're just going to borrow like a phrase from there. The Bible says, And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of a beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me. But they will let you live. 
I want us to read that again. He says, therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is wife, this is his wife and they will kill me but they will let you live. I want to say something here for a second. Two things were going on in here. Abraham was like, these people would want to take the good thing that I have. He recognized that he needed to be alert and to be conscious of entering someone else's territory, particularly if there is a history of animosity. Now he's going into a territory that takes from everybody forcefully. And so he decided that he needed to do something about it. He was like, ah, oh, we need to do something. And he told his wife, if, I, if they know you're my wife, they're going to kill me. And then you're going to leave. How about if we said that you're my sister? Because in reality, you are my sister. Because you know, I think Sarai was Abraham's half-sister. Don't even think about it. That was like 3,000 years ago. They do all kinds of stuff back then, okay? There were not that many people in the world. So you take who you get, all righty? And don't you be calling the names of any towns or cities or states around here, okay? That's not what this is about. Because I know what people can be like. They're like, oh, I know just somewhere not too far from here. People do that. <laughs> to each his own. Abraham did what Abraham had to do. Right? But what I want to draw from that was that that patriarch of faith, regardless of his, his own strategy, one thing that we can learn from him was his consciousness of what could potentially happen as they were entering, entering into Egypt. Now let me show you what Jesus recommends as you are approaching Egypt. Now let me say this very quickly. Egypt at the time of Abraham was where all the best things that you can find in this world, the smartest people, the strongest people, the artisans, the number one artist in the world, everybody was in Egypt. Egypt wanted, wanted the best of everything. And so when you're getting into a territory that is known and reputable for always taking the best of the best and you know that you have something of worth, you have to beware. Alrighty? So look at Egypt and look at hell. Hell is very much like that too. Sometimes it's like the best of the things in our world are heading straight to hell in a handbasket. The best businessmen, the best musicians, the best producers of music, of art. That is where they all are. Sometimes, say that one more time. <laughs> so she said some of the best pastors or best preachers. <laughs> no, but in reality, come on. Let's face it. The devil is going after. What did I tell you on Saturday? On Saturday, I was able to establish here through scripture that the devil is in fierce competition with God. So he wants the best of the field, even though he's not the owner of the field. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You understand what I mean? There was a poem that I read from an old, old, old Hebrew text. And they said, behold, the creator returns to receive the best of the earth, even the oils of the field and the grains thereof. Everybody's known for thousands of years that the owner of the field is coming back to receive the best of the field, the oil and the grain thereof. And that is exactly what the devil's been doing too as a thief, stealing, killing and destroying. So the moment we know that we are approaching the gates of hell because we have to before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. He says, occupy till I come. As I am in this world, so are you. Greater works than I did, shall you do. If I spoil principalities and powers, I am building you to do the same, to approach the gates of hell. That is why you can't concern yourself too much with the affairs of this world because you are my soldier. You live, you die, all for me. And you know that I've taught here also before that the kind of soldiers that God is looking for are soldiers who have already died. God does not want to send people to war who may be afraid of dying. That is why he wants you to die first before you fight. Amen. 
You see what I'm saying? Because a dead man, the Bible says he's been given for man, wants to live, and after death, judgment. So if you have already died to self, then you can go into that battle because you have nothing to lose. You know that Mexican proverb that says, you don't see a tree that falls two times. A tree doesn't fall two times. Once it falls, it's falling. You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why God is using the army of the undead. Because they're not afraid of death. Look at what he did. He told Ezekiel, come, I want to show you the kind of army that I am fighting with. And he took him to the valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel was like, so where is the army? And God said, you're looking at it. And then he, come, he said to him, now you speak, let life come. And he commanded the wind, which is the power of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, the resurrection power according to Romans chapter 8. And the bones rose and became a mighty army. Can they die again? No, because they've already died. It's been given to man, wants to live, and after death, judgment. When Jesus was going to the cross, the people that were around him, they had never died. So days leading to the cross, Peter and the rest of them, particularly Philip, if you remember, they kept convincing Jesus that it was a bad idea to go to Jerusalem because they said, if you go there, they're going to kill you and we don't want you to die. Jesus was surrounded by men who were afraid of death and he knew that he needed to die. So what did he do? He ditched them. He first of all called three of them to see whether their story would change. And they were going up the mountain. And the same three people, Peter, James, and John, that he separated from the rest of the doubters like Thomas and Philip. Of course, Matt, Matthew was very passive. Not this one. This one is active. Matthew was always observing. What are they saying over there? Maybe I'll agree with them for a minute. That's the reason why you never hear him say much. But then he wrote a lot. And when you study the book of Matthew, you recognize that Matthew is always coming from two perspectives all the time. And that is why he wrote so much. He's always coming from two perspectives. When you read his accounts, he will report the account in such a way that you can tell that story in two different ways. And that's why Matthew generally just agrees with the other gospel. Because if you know how to look, you will find what the others are saying in Matthew. So Jesus left all those people behind. He said, let's see whether there's hope for these ones. He took Peter, James, and John. And they were still saying, Jesus, we don't like the idea of you dying. You must not die. And guess what? He left them and he went to find for himself those that will encourage him. You see, many of us were surrounded by too many people who don't even know we're at war to start with. And that is the reason why they're always asking you to go buying and selling because they don't know we're at war. They're always speaking to you about the things of pleasure. They're always complaining to you about what people are not doing right when we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That brother at our church, that sister that we know from fellowship, they are not the enemies. The real enemies are the principalities and powers and the strong man that is in hell. So why should I busy myself with, rumor, with rumors of what people are doing? No, I pray for them to be strong enough to come and fight alongside with me. But many of us were too surrounded by people who have already lost the battle before it even starts. They're called losers. And the Bible says that the companionship of fools will be destroyed. Why would they be so easily destroyed? Because they don't even know they're at war. When the enemy comes, the enemy will find them playing bingo. The enemy will find them playing with cards, drinking coffee and getting high because they don't know they're at war. So they will be like a walkover for the, for the enemy. But let me tell you something, the enemy does not want to kill them, the enemy wants to use them to stop God. Let me say that again. You see, I tell you what, I remember the prayer that a sister at our church said. This must have been in 1992 or 93, thereabouts. She just got saved. No, it was 91. She just got saved and she was on fire for God. And you know one of the things that she said, a baby believer, someone who just got saved. She said, I told God before leaving home that if I come this close to losing my faith, it should kill me at that particular point in time. Because I would rather die with faith in my heart than live many days without what I have now. We thought it was a dangerous prayer. But I wish that some of the people who heard what she said had prayed the same. Because now we saw many of them fall by the wayside, running after the cares of this life and seeking the pleasures thereof by so doing, gaining the world, but losing their soul. You see, that is the reason why the devil does not want to kill these people. Because what does it profit the devil if he kills someone who is already losing at life? 
Someone who is already walking around like a zombie, seeking their own pleasure rather than seeking the will of God. The devil does not need to kill them. They, are, they can be useful in opposition against God. And that's why one of the things that God revealed to me about a year and a half ago of the strategy of Satan is that Satan is going around using subtlety to recruit people into his army. And, I, and it's very subtle because the way he's doing it, Travis, is Satan is not coming to say, oh, I like the way you, you, you lifted that you know, crate of water. You must be stronger. I need you to come to my army. No, that's not what he's doing. The Bible says, let me tell you what the devil found in scripture. The Lord showed it to me. The devil found a scripture that he's been using to recruit people. And you know what that scripture is? The Bible says to be carnally minded is enmity against God. So Satan knows that all he needs is to look for people who are in the flesh. Because when you are in the flesh, your natural orientation changes to being an enemy of God. And the enemy of your enemy is your friend. That's why the Bible says that friendship with the world is enmity against God. So the devil is going around like a roaring lion. And what he's doing is he's going around like a roaring lion, scaring people. And only the people that are in the flesh can be afraid of someone that's not really a lion. Yeah. Because we know that Jesus is the real lion and he's for us, he's not against us. Jesus is not going to hide behind the rock to scare me. So if I see anybody hiding, trying to jump on and say, boo, then I'm like, oh, come on, devil, take off your mask. What have you been up to? You understand what I mean? So the devil knows that if he scares people and they respond by fear, then they are in the flesh. And if they are in the flesh, their polarity is that of enmity against God. He just doesn't get in line. And that is how he's been walking around, recruiting for himself an army. Oh, y'all didn't get, you don't get it just yet. Let me read to you Genesis 12, 12 again. What does it say? It says, therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but they will let you live. But is that the kind of life that you want to live? The devil would let you live only if he can use you to fight against God. The devil is only going after the ones that he knows they're already completely sold. And he knows there's nothing I can do about this one. This one has already left all. Even if this guy today decides that he doesn't want to go forward in this battle, he has nowhere else to go. Like the apostles, the disciples, Jesus asked them, 4,000 people just left Jesus. And Jesus looked at the two of them. Are you not going to leave also? <laughs> and they were like, oh, Jesus, you have jokes. <laughs> to whom shall we go? To what shall we return? Have we not left all to follow you? The people who have left all to follow him are the kind of soldiers that he is looking for. But before they got to that point, Jesus took them up the mountain to show them what a real soldier looks like. He went on the mountain that we refer to as the Mount of Transfiguration. And two generals showed up. And these were men who have died, who are now living again. And Jesus was like, yeah, these are the kind of people that I need around me when I am going to die. Because they are not afraid of death. You need to surround yourself with people who are ready to do battle in the name of God. Even if it means they have to lose everything. Because it's better to lose everything and gain the kingdom. So today my submission to you is this. The devil has his eyes on people that he can recruit. He wants Sarah, Sarai to live. Because the plan of the enemy for those people who are of the flesh is that he would recruit them. And so I want people profusely for like six months straight, if you remember, telling them, stop being in the flesh. Many of those people who sat and listened to those teachers, maybe not many, but a good number of them, refused to repent and switch over into the spirit. And when the wind of the enemy came, he swept all of them away. The Bible tells us that the women that are loaded with sin, they are the ones that the tail bearers will deceive. 
So when we called for you to repent and you did not repent, you have qualified yourself to believe every lie of the enemy because you had an opportunity to immune your heart against deception, but you refused because you kept choosing the flesh. It's only a reminder today, so that's why I'm not getting into the details of it. But one thing that I want you to know, folks, is that Jesus is building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I have shown you one aspect of warfare, which is to recognize the potential of the enemy and to also warn the others about what the enemy wants to do to them. Abraham told Sarai, these Egyptians, they may kill me, but they will let you leave because they want to recruit you onto their side and by so doing, completely destroy your destiny. Now look at what Jesus said. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And this is a call to repentance. In case you didn't know, the Lord said to me to spell it out that it is a call to repentance. Why is it a call to repentance? Because the, the message of the one that is crying, the voice that is crying in the wilderness is calling people unto repentance because what is happening is that we are going to war and whether you like it or not, you will fight on one side. You cannot fight both sides. You have to choose a side and if you do not choose a side, a side will be chosen for you by the one who is fighting lawlessly. God is not going to force you to come and fight on his side. God wants you to choose him because God's approach is love and love is not forced, it is chosen. And that's why God is not fighting with zombies. God is fighting with people who have chosen him and that's what the Bible says that Jesus will show up with tens of thousands of his saints. The saints, by definition, are the ones that have chosen Jesus above all else. The ones who were referred to as saints in the Bible were the ones who saw that if they would deny Jesus right here, they would go home. But if they continue to profess Jesus as they're climbing the stage to where Caesar was, they were going to be fed to angry and hungry lions and they kept taking those steps singing the praise of the Messiah and that's why they were called saints the definition of saints is simply the ones who have chosen Jesus above all else they loved not their own lives even unto death and those are the ones that Jesus is coming to fight that is bringing to battle. Jesus knows what he's doing. He's not going to bring people to battle who will be distracted by the cares of this world because all the devil has to do is present the golden calf and they're like, Jesus, we'll be right back. We may get a piece of this golden calf. But you need to have died to self. You see, mammon should not have any hold on you. Mammon should not have any hold on you. And, and you will be tested. We are all being tested. And the tests are happening more quickly and more subtly in the times that we're in. But God still wants you to choose himself. You know what uh, Job said? He says, even though he slays me, I will trust him. Let nothing be too precious to you than the grip of the hand of Jesus. No matter what the devil is dangling at you, do not let go of the hand of the Lord Jesus. Because... The, <laughs> You will reap if you do not faint. There is a reward at the end of this tenacity. Now let's go. Matthew chapter, what did I say again? 11 verse 12. Yeah, the Bible says, as from the days of John the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent shall take it by force. As we are approaching the gates of enemy. Two things are happening, okay? I've described those two things as separate images, but let me put it together for you. This is the church on one hand, right? Because we haven't been through hell just yet. And someone is like, Brother Moses, you don't know what I've been through. And now you've been through trials. Hell is a different ball game. That was what Jesus did. He went through persecution. He went through disappointments. He went through uh, betrayal. And those are the kind of things that we are going through that is making us feel like we're in hell. No, 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 you're not in hell just yet. He did all of that and he went through death before getting to hell. And so we, the church, we're on this side. The gates of hell is here and Jesus is on that other side because he's already passed through this place and is waiting for you on the other side. 
And so what he is telling you to do is to make sure that you pass through this place so that you can get to that place. The Bible says whom he did for know, he called, and whom he called, he justified. But before being called, between foreknowledge, there's predestination. And the way God predestines us is to first of all go through the path and leave us footprints that we need to follow. The footprints of Jesus in the sand of time is called obedience. You understand what I mean? The way Jesus left us his footprint in the sands of time is by his acts of obedience. The Bible says he obeyed his heavenly father even to the death of the cross, which is the most gruesome kind of death. So that you and I have no excuse. How am I going to go through hell? How am I going to make it to the other side wherein I am received into the glory of my heavenly father? By being obedient every step of the way to what God is saying as opposed to what my flesh is saying. So Jesus is on that side, we are on this side, and he wants us to make it through. And he is telling you that when I say that the kingdom is at hand, it means that you are approaching this gate, and I am also approaching this other side of the gate of hell to receive you. So those are the two things that are happening at the same time. But one thing that is common to those two things, the second coming of the Lord Jesus and the kingdom that is coming is the gate of hell that is in between. And so we know that we have to pass through that gate of hell. So how do we do that? Jesus says, as from the days of John the Baptist, which means from the time it was announced that the kingdom of God is coming, Satan buckled up, raised his soldiers started aggressive, aggressively recruiting more soldiers so that they can stop that gate from opening because they don't want to lose what they already have. So how are you going to take it? Jesus says, the ones that are holding on to the kingdom, they don't want to let it go. And they're doing it violently. He says, the violent take it by force. So the person who currently, or the forces that are currently holding the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy. You see those voices that keep telling you, oh, that you're not good enough. That keep telling you that God is not looking for people like you. Those voices that keep telling you that, oh, the way you treated that person, well, I wouldn't do that. Even though you knew in your heart that you were being led by the Lord. Every voice that questions your righteousness is speaking from the gate of hell. Because they don't want you to enjoy righteousness. You see, if you do not have that righteousness consciousness, that it is not by power nor by might, but by the Spirit of God. If you don't have that righteousness consciousness, that the blood of the Lamb has washed you clean and made you the righteousness of God, Satan continues to challenge your righteousness because every moment of time that you spend feeling guilty, feeling condemned, doubting if you're good enough for God, is all those times that Satan can then claim and hold on to your righteousness. Every time that you bow your head and you're sorrowful because the landlord has written you a letter telling you to leave his property and then you sit in front of the porch feeling sad, that is a moment of your life that you are not living in the joy of your salvation. Every second that you spend being sad is going into Satan's account because life abhors a vacuum. If it's not in your heart, it's in hell. It has to be in one place or the other. That is righteousness and joy. What about peace? Every time that you worry about what you will eat, about what you will drink, every time you worry about the same things that you have prayed about, if you spend two hours worrying, that is two hours worth of precious ointment that is being fed into hell because of your carelessness, because of your ignorance. See, let me tell you something. The devil has nothing of his own. When he was kicked out of heaven, there was no provision made for them. The Bible says that when Michael drove Satan and the third of angels out of heaven, their place was no more. That means heaven was not giving them any more allocations and they need to survive. And that is the reason why they don't joke with their assignment because their lives depend on you playing into their hands constantly. The kingdom of God is not one place. Just like Megiddo is not one place, but the kingdom of God is the hearts of men because the Bible says Jesus himself speaking, he says the kingdom of God has come to be with men in their hearts accessible through their mouths. 
And that is the reason why you and I need to recognize that that kingdom of God is not in meat, is not in drink, but as the Bible says, it is in righteousness, peace, and joy. Those are the components of the kingdom of God. And we allow those three things to slip away from us on the daily. We have equipped the kingdom of darkness long enough. It is time for us to wake up and starve the kingdom of darkness. The best way to defeat an enemy is to beseech them and to starve them. And so that when you show up, they're too haggard to lift a finger against you. That was what Jesus did. He starved the kingdom of Satan. By the time he showed up, they were already weak because since he had been around from the days of John the Baptist, the moment John's been announcing and people have been coming into the water to baptize, to get baptized and repent of their sins. And the moment they set their eyes on the man of Calvary who was going around seeking good, even the man of Galilee, people were beginning to have a taste of the kingdom of God and holding on to it. And so Satan and his cohorts were sitting there. No more peace was coming their way. No more righteousness was coming their way. And certainly no more joy because the joy of the world is walking around doing good good let me tell you something when you live operating a strategy like that every battle is a one battle so as we're approaching the gates of hell we need to starve those soldiers on the other side we need to starve the opposition they live and breathe on what we supply which is the free gift of God that brings us the righteousness the peace and the joy so what do you do hold on to your righteousness hold on to your peace and you have to hold on to it violently the Bible says as from the day of the days of John the Baptist the kingdom of God suffers violence the word suffers there means experiences allows is subject to that's what it means. So the kingdom of God has been experiencing this tussle, this battle from the days of John the Baptist. From the moment the announcement is made, everybody's been on red alert. And so what does the Bible say you do? The Bible says recognize that the violent want to take it by force. So what do you do? You take it from them. And you have to take it forcefully. So the things of your righteousness are no longer reminded, they're no longer like, ah, oh, man, I heard this pastor Joseph, he's, he, he's preached and he says that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So I'm just going to say that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No. You have to say it with all zest and gusto. Because the person who told you to say it, told you to say it as though you are at war. So when the devil comes and he brings a thought of unrighteousness, what do you do? You shut it down violently because if you do not, the people that you're messing with, they're not playing. I told you that the greatest trick, the greatest trick that Satan ever pulled was to convince us that we're not soldiers. But if you know that you are a soldier of the cross, everything then becomes a serious business. And it's not always going to be like that. Jesus says, you will come into the rest of your master. But before you come into that rest, you will wrestle. And that is the reason why, folks, I put it to you that in the days that we are approaching, I have mentioned the word repent like 50 times, but that was Bennett's cue. So let Bennett come in and let the band come up. And then we'll break bread. Alan, let's do something very different. Can you give everybody the communion first of all so that we do that in all solemnness before the traffic comes in? But I tell you this, folks, we have come to such a time wherein the devil is looking, is still looking for people in the flesh, right? All of what happened in the last two years from 2020 has been a series of rumors of war because the devil's recognized that he doesn't even really have to bring a real war. Real wars are expensive, but rumors of war are easy. Just find the man that controls the news and make sure that you replace him with one of your goons and then everything that's coming out of the news then becomes a lie, becomes rumors of war so that the hearts of men will begin to fill them with fear. And that way, you're making the work easy for the angels who are looking for the saints. Because the moment they see the people that are panicking, they're like, Satan, you can have these ones, they're yours. We will take these ones. These ones have faith and confidence in God. They're not just saying that they're believers. They truly believe in the God of their salvation. That is the reason why no matter what you say about the economy, they're not moved. They're continuing to invest. They continue to build. They continue to pray. They continue to live their lives because they know that their sufficiency does not consist in the things of the economy. What does the Bible say? Apostle Paul speaking. He says the, abund the sufficiency of a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he owns. 
You understand what I mean? And so that is the man that is confident in God. What makes you that confident in God? The righteousness of God. The moment you know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I've explained this to you before and I'm going to remind you of it again so we can break bread. The Bible says, and this was David speaking, he says, I have seen, he says I was young and I've seen a lot of things. I've seen the lion's cub go hungry. The same lion who is the king of the jungle have seen situations wherein the lion was not even able to feed its own. He said, I was young, but now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging for bread. So the moment that I know that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that means I can never lack anything good. The devil wants you to feel guilty, not because when you're feeling guilty, he's like, oh my God, I need that feeling guilty. No, the enemy wants you to feel guilty because he's hoping that in that season of guilt, you miss out on heaven's allocation. Maybe he will get what is in your name. Because while you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, let me tell you something. There is nothing that you need that he won't provide. You see, your provision is guaranteed. Because your heavenly father is the Lord of providence. But you have to be in righteousness. Your thinking has to be as that of someone for whom Jesus died. You see the devil is always telling you that you're not doing enough or that you're doing too much. The only person that can tell me that I am doing too much is the Holy Spirit. And when he says it, it brings peace. When Satan says it, he brings agitation. Every, every instruction or, or every assessment of Satan brings ag agitation because the things that Satan calls out in our lives are the things that our flesh will respond to. But when God calls it out in your life, guess what? The Bible says it is God, even God, that hastens our steps unto righteousness. When God is giving you, when God is checking you on something that you're doing too much of, you will have peace about it. Because when he spoke, there was peace even upon the troubled sea. But when you were at peace and Satan speaks, he's trying to get your flesh to respond. So I'm just going to wait for this gentleman to start playing something and then we're going to break bread today. But I tell you one thing, why don't you hold this scripture to your heart as we break bread? Isaiah 55 verse 7. Isaiah 55 verse 7. So the conclusion of the matter is this. We need to repent from dead works. We need to repent from being careless with the elements of the kingdom of God. Shut down every thought that wants to agitate you from your peace. Shut down every thought or situation that wants to take your joy. Because every moment you spend worrying, again, is moments that feed the enemy. Because when you are worrying, you do not have peace. And when that peace is not in your heart, it has to be somewhere. Where does it go? It goes to hell. Because it's either it's in your heart or it's in hell. Why? Because heaven has already released it and heaven is not taking it back. Because the Bible says that the gifts and the callings of God, they are without repentance. Every blessing that leaves heaven in your name, God has already given a, giving it as a gift. He doesn't take it back. So if you see a man of God who is called and anointed by God to go to the nations, who is wallowing in the pubs and wallowing in sin, every divine enablement that he has is still available in this realm, but it's not in him because it requires obedience for you to be able to function with the unction. So where is all that power? It's with Satan. That is the reason why you see people on the outside, they seem to be doing well. There's 50,000 people in their church. They have half a dozen Rolls Royce. They seem to be doing good because they were truly called by God and given the divine enablement to be able to bring treasures into the kingdom of God. But Satan's fooled them to release the true treasures because he's not giving them pleasures. So what do we do? We need to repent from dead works. We need to have a change of heart the way we relate to the things of the kingdom. Your righteousness is key. Shut down every voice that brings condemnation. Your peace is critical. Shut down everything that could bring you worry. Let me tell you something. Your father owns everything, even a cattle upon a thousand hills. So when somebody at work tells you that because you came late, they're going to take away your vacation, it's not in their hand. It's not in the hand because the Bible says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A man cannot take what God has given to me. They can threaten by Satan to see whether my heart will flinch. 
But I also know that I do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So I don't slap their face because they insulted me. I just smile and I bless them. And by so doing, I'm heaping coals of fire. And so the moment I leave the presence of the one that is threatening me, I go into the presence of the one who died for me. And I tell him, I say, Lord, look upon their threats and let your hand move in my favor. Amen. Remember when, P when Peter and the rest of the saints were kicked out of town by the lords of the day in Acts chapter 4. And they were told, as they were leaving the courts of town, they said to them, come back, come back, come back. We don't want to hear you mention the name Jesus ever again. Do you understand? What did Peter do? There was no record of Peter and the saints fighting the authority. They were not quoting the law and saying we have freedom of speech. We can say whatever we want. No, they did not fight with horses and chariots. They did not fight with weapons of the flesh or of the system. They just said, thank you. And the Bible says that same night, they found somebody's house. And they went there. And Peter said, look upon their threats. Lord, you see what they're doing? And you move. Let them feel your hand. That is exactly what we need to do. Just be confident that what God has called you to do, the only person that can stop you is you and your disobedience. As long as you are obedient. Anyway, let me not preach another sermon. Isaiah 55 verse 7. What? When was it? 9 o'clock? Was, it was just 8, 15, a little while ago. Isaiah 55 verse 7. The Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. The Bible says, let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. We need new ways of thinking. We need to be thinking like soldiers. We need to be thinking as people upon whom the end of the ages have come. Who need to advance and prevail over the gates of hell. And we do so by holding on to the righteousness, the peace, and the joy. The Lord would have me say this to you. The one who has constantly been worrying because of all the opposition that has come against you. The Lord says you have been focusing too much on what Satan is doing. And that is why it keeps getting bigger. You know what you focus on is what you magnify. The Lord is saying to you today, believe that there is nothing that man can do unto you. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? The fear of man, the Bible says, brings only a sneer. The reason why you've not been able to move freely in the armor of God is because you are constrained by the fear of what man can do. Whatever they think they can take away from you, ask them to quickly come and take it. And let's see whether they can leave you naked when God has already clothed you in his favor. Fear not, he says, because I am with you. Amen. let us break bread let me tell you something as you're standing up I'm going to quickly show you something from the book of Job chapter 2 those are the things that these are some of the things that the moment you see it and you know it <laughs> there are certain demons will leave you alone simply because they know that you have become too dangerous let me show you something Job in Job chapter 2 verse 21 I mean, Job chapter, um, yeah, it's not 221, it's 121. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I quoted it, but I want you to see where it's at. I want you to meditate on this scripture. You know what this scripture does to the heart of a man? When you meditate upon it right, it allows for your heart to let go of the cares of this world. Because all those things that are trying to cling onto you, they're not your true covering. Your true covering is the glory of God. And as long as he has promised you his glory, he will deliver that glory. So do not let anything that is being taken away from you make you feel exposed. The reason why many of us are not answering the call of God is because we believe that the moment we move in the direction of what God is saying, we will lose certain things in the world, lose them quickly because you do not need them. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your love that brought us the Lord Jesus. Jesus, thank you for allowing your body to be broken and for allowing your blood to be shed.
and for also letting us know the power that is in your sacrifice so that as often as we have the opportunity we might be brought into remembrance of the great work that you did for us and by so doing we can recalibrate our belief system we can have our hearts reconditioned and our minds renewed as we do this today father we ask for true repentance repentance that bears the fruits of righteousness in each of our lives in each and every life that is present here today in the mighty name of Jesus we receive this as the body of Jesus we receive the bread as the body of Jesus and as we eat of it today we eat unto life we receive his blood we receive this wine as his blood as we drink of it today we drink unto glory in the mighty name of Jesus you may eat and you may drink hold on a second before you before you eat hold on Revelations 11 I saw people standing here on one leg the Lord is saying you can't stand on one leg I gave you two legs for a reason so before you eat that if it's already in your mouth just keep it there you see because we need to overcome the wolf see there are some literal warfare that you should no longer be fighting by now certain things should be behind you you've got a higher price Paul says forgetting the things that are behind I am pressing on toward the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus because there is a higher calling there is a higher calling if you're still struggling with unforgiveness you have spent too much time at that battlefield there is there's not much in that battlefield to be honest it is only an entryway. Jesus says, if you are coming to the presence of God, bearing a sacrifice, make sure there is no unforgiveness in your heart. Why? Because it's a gateway. It only gets you in. But once it gets you in, what do you get? Then you need to move beyond the miserable elements of this world. So there are little battles that you've been fighting and the reason why you're still there and standing on one leg is because of the fact that you are still struggling with certain little things. So Revelation 11, 7. We need to take care of that today. It is my desire that as I am looking upon the faces that are in here, what I am seeing in the spirit improves. Because I labor over you all and I would love to see Christ formed in you the hope of glory. I don't want one-legged believers standing next to me in line. We are at war for crying out loud. You should not be the one exposing your brethren. Revelation 11, 7. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Revelations 11, 7. And look at what it says. The Bible says, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. Let me say this slowly. Standing on one leg is a depiction of fear. If you are not sure whether you need to enter a place, you're like moving on with one leg because you are not confident. The reason why many of you are not confident to go to battle in the name of God and claim back the kingdom of God as Jesus said, by violence. Matthew 12, 11, the kingdom of God suffers violence, 11, 12, and the violent shall take it by force. The reason why you're not stepping into battle is because you're still afraid for your lives. Let me tell you something, none of us is making it out alive. The Bible says that when they were done with their testimony, the beast from the abyss came and it killed them because that final death after we have completed our assignment is what allows for us to ascend into glory. And so if you know that none of us is making it out alive because we are his witnesses and that is the way we get out of here, why are you afraid? Hallelujah. Folks, it is in the book. It is not, a, I'm not making this up. It is in the book. The Bible says the Lord is raising his two witnesses in the spirit of what? Of Moses and Elijah. Because the two witnesses are the two olive trees that are in the presence of the Lord. Even the two golden lampstands that have been in the presence of the Most High from time immemorial. And who are they? They are the nation of Israel and the church. Because one of them was saved through the faith of Abraham and the other one was the wild olive that was grafted in the body of Christ and so we are the two witnesses and this is the end of us the Bible says that we were overpowered by the beast that is coming from the abyss 
two years ago, the Lord revealed to me the beast from the abyss. It shook me almost to my very foundation. It was the ugliest and the most terrifying thing that I had ever seen. I shared the story with you all. I was about to pray for a young lady as soon as I put my hand on her shoulder. I left that place. We were in Atlanta. I was in the deep and I saw the beast rising out of the beast. So let me tell you something. It's already happening. The beast is on its way. We, our time is short. And so that is the reason why when God is asking you to do a thing, it requires for you to die to self. It requires for you to do it with all, all boldness. Yeah, you die to self or boldness. If he tells you that place that you are going to, there is nothing there for you, believe him. Stay at home. Study the word. Let him speak to you. Let nothing mean more to you than whatever comes out of his mouth. He is the good shepherd. He wants you to know his voice and to follow through. So folks, thank God God is not showing me any one person in particular, but I just know that there are people standing on one leg in here but we are an army. Everybody needs to stand in all godly confidence and be ready for whatever may come. Simply because we cannot say that we are gods when we are only partially gods. Gods. If you're going to be gods, you have to be 100% gods. You have to belong to him 100%. You must be ready. Jesus showed me right now and I shared it with you. He said to me, my footprints in the sand is what? Is obedience. And there are two steps, two feet. Obedience is not, you can't hop your way through hell. You have to walk on both legs. And that confidence is very key. Let me help you with one more scripture and then we're going to close on this one. Matthew 12, 18. And look at what it says. Matthew 12, 18. He says, behold, my servant whom I have chosen. My beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will trust. The father says I am pleased with the Lord Jesus. Because he has his mode of operation and is going to stick with it to the end. Your mode of operation as a believer is to move like Jesus moved. You are not supposed to quarrel. You're not supposed to be in the flesh. You're supposed to be confident in God, operating with godly confidence. Godly confidence brings peace. But when you're hopping, you're stomping. Even the devil knows where your fear is. So I'm encouraging you follow your mode this is the only way God is going to be pleased with us when we stick to our guns when we stick to what he has said and by obedience we put the devil to shame I'm going to say one prayer for us today it's from the book of Micah chapter 1 verse 7 and as we break bread I want us to, to say this Micah 1 7 over our bread and swallow it because in the days ahead you know me, I'm the man of the days ahead. I'm always talking about the days ahead because I'm a watchman on the tower. My mission is to tell you what is to come. Yours is to make of it what you would. But I pray that what you would do is take it with a heart of obedience and execute as a good soldier of the cross. Matthew 1, 7, look at what it says. It says, all her carved images shall be beaten into pieces and all her pay as a harlot shall be what? Shall be burned with the fire. All her pay as a harlot. Everything that we have done in the flesh needs to go into the fire. Every idol that we have exalted in our hearts above God, they need to what? They need to be broken in pieces. So as you're breaking bread today, say to yourself before the Lord, whatever it is that my heart is afraid to lose, I give it up right now. Whatever I've held precious, like those idols that are the work of my own hands, Lord, let them be broken into pieces. Let every pay that I have received, every pleasure that I have drawn from the flesh, Lord, let them be taken. I am for you and you alone, so that there is nothing of Satan inside of me. In the mighty name of Jesus, you may eat and you may drink. Hallelujah. I just want to say to you, Tia, you were here on Saturday. You heard me speak about sympathy. 
how we need to do things not out of the sympathy of our hearts but how we need to do things because the Lord said so you have already spent enough time with them now it's time for you to go where the Lord leads you know why because if you keep thinking oh maybe if I do this with them a little bit more do that with them a little bit more maybe they will see my heart no they've had enough time to see your heart they've only chosen not to see it set yourself free from every requirement of man so that you can fulfill the requirement of God it is that simple the weight will just fall off your shoulders you understand what I mean because again you were here on Saturday that word was for you when the Lord said to me to declare over the house oh no man nothing but the love you do not owe anybody an explanation. You just owe them the love of God. You see what I mean? Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You're free to be the believer that God's called you to be. And it doesn't matter if somebody likes it or not. As long as it is pleasing to your heavenly Father, you are off to the races. God bless you, Communion House. Thanks for coming. Our time is fast spent. The offering announcement is going to be on the screen. You know what to do. And then this weekend is when the women have their retreat. So every other person that is not going for the retreat, Make sure you're here and bring somebody with you. We don't want to feel their absence. Can we have a deal on that? Praise the Lord. So let me just pray for you very quickly before we leave. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hey, Sikanda Burudu Shteyalaba. Can we just turn that down a little bit? I just need to quickly drop this word. I was about to close my Bible. And as soon as I closed it, light started to shine from it. So I declare over you today that the light of the word of God that is found in the place of meditation will be yours. That once you get up from studying the word of God and you close your Bible, that the word will continue to speak to you. That your heart will meditate on the word of God. Continually, you will be in the word. Continually, the word will be in you. And by so doing, you will be above always and not beneath. Because the buoyancy of a man's life is the, is the wind of the spirit. And the words that I speak to you, Jesus says, they are spirit and they are life. Let this word dwell richly in you. I am praying for you today. I'm not encouraging you. I'm not counseling you. I am declaring over you because the Bible says what you have is what you give. And this is something that the Lord has gifted to me when I am looking into the Bible or not, I keep hearing the word. And I pray for you also that that will be your portion in a new dimension from this moment onwards. Praise the Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Thank you for coming.